Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm your host Tony Coleman and today I'm going to go over some tips and tricks for getting Rosetta set up for the upcoming challenges. But before I do, do me a big favor and click the subscribe button and if you also don't mind after watching the video hit the like button. This will help out quite a bit for my channel. Thank you. So we're going to cover a few things. One, I will show you how to get Rosetta attached to your client. I'm going to assume you've already installed the Boink software. If you haven't, I do have a few other videos that you can uh, find on my channel uh, for installing Boink. One for Windows 10, one for Ubuntu, and one for Mint. Uh, I may have more in the future, so definitely check those out. So. This is a Windows 10 virtual machine. I've got Boink already installed, but as you can see, Rosetta is not currently on my list. I typically use an account manager. I'm not going to go over that in this specific video, but I will show you how to attach manually. So from the advanced view, if you haven't already gone there, this may be what you're looking at. Just go into advanced, tools, and add project. You want to scroll down to Rosetta at home, hit next, you will communicate with their servers. If you haven't created an account yet, you can do so here. I've already got an account. It's now added. And once it's synced up, you'll see your account name and your team, if you're a part of the team already, um, also update here. If you aren't part of the team, I can also show you where you would go to get on there. So here I'm already synced up. I'm already downloading a work unit. The specific virtual machine only has, I believe, one uh, CPU thread assigned to it. If not, it may be two. But, uh, it's already in the process of downloading work. Now, some of you might think, okay, I'm good to go, but there's more configurations that I would recommend doing. Let's go to their website. Get logged in. See, I have private messages from different people because of the pentathlon. But what I'm going to show you here is the preferences. Go to Rosetta Home Preference. Edit your preference, which this is the default profile. And then you're going to want to change your target CPU runtime. The default is eight hours. Now you can lower it all the way down to one hour. Actually, uh, two hours or you can go up to uh, they've added additional up to a day and a half I recommend changing it to the maximum and the reason for that is because the work unit will actually pack more research into each work unit so you'll still be getting the same amount of work done over that one day and a half the difference is you will have less data transfers so if you're like me and you have a data limit on your home internet connection uh, this will help reduce the amount of data that you're transferring throughout the day for all these work units the disadvantage to this would be if you spend a day and a half and you error out well you're going to lose a day and a half worth of work per work unit the errors if you only had it set to two hours you'd only lose the two hours of work um, if you have a pretty reliable system, you shouldn't be erroring out very often, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Another advantage to setting your target CPU time to a day and a half is it's going to put less strain on the project servers due to having far fewer um, transfers for, for the work units themselves. So once you've changed that, hit your update preferences. 
and that's all you need to do as far as that goes whenever my client downloads new work it will uh, try to pull about a day and a half's worth of runtime per work unit going forward now towards the end of a challenge you may want to change that back down to two hours because you want your work units to uh, finish and return quickly that way you get the maximum amount of points during the time frame however if you have a longer challenge going on such as the pentathlon this year the pentathlons giving up to 10 days for the regular duration plus you're getting about a two to three day notice for downloading work units. Work units recently have only been giving about a three day deadline. So if you were to bunker a bunch of work units, obviously you'd only want to get about two to three way dates worth of cash in there. And uh, well, if you're going to have a day and a half work units, you get plenty of time to uh, finish them. However, when you get down to the last couple days of the, the pentathlon or whatever other challenge you're doing, you're going to want to change it back down something smaller most likely two hours so that you can squeeze every work unit you possibly can in during that time you also don't want a lot of your work sitting there waiting to be uploaded and then suddenly their servers go down at the end of the challenge because everybody's trying to drop all the last work units they would bunkered up uh, that does happen and sometimes you can't report work so you're better off at the end of the challenge having smaller work units at the beginning of a challenge possibly the longer ones and uh, that'll simplify a lot of things for the project and for you. So I mentioned stuff about bunkering. Um, what is bunkering and why should you do it? Or should not do it in, for that matter. And quite frankly, it's a term used during, usually for challenges specifically. Um, and it's only used in challenges that don't monitor when working units are sent it in regards to the start time of the challenge. There are some challenges that limit you to only work downloaded during the challenge time frame. Prime Grid is really good about doing that. Um, with Prime Grid, when they do theirs, if you download it early, those work units won't count. If you uh, return work after the deadline, those don't count. Whereas most challenges you can download work in advance uh, load up a, a bunch of it and then drop it during the actual deadline and just make sure you get it in before the end deadline and you end up getting extra days worth of runtime thrown into it it's kind of a dirty tactic um, but most teams do it and basically how it works is before the challenge you increase your cash in Boeing settings to download a large number of days worth of work you then disable your network communication so that it doesn't report the work back to the server. Then when the challenge begins, you turn your network communications back on and you dump a ton of work all at once on the very first day, second day, or basically some time frame during the challenge so that you get credit for all that extra work. So what you would do is plan ahead for the challenge. Since Point will let you cash up to 10 days worth of work, you'll want to start your bunkering up to 10 days in advance depending on the challenge and also the project, because sometimes projects don't have 10-day deadlines. In this case, Rosetta's been doing about three. So you'd load up a bunch of work, disable your networking, and let it process. Challenge starts, turn on your networking, upload all your work, and that's considered a bunker drop. There, there are multiple uses for this. Uh, one is from the description I gave, a, a, a way to get a few extra days worth of work thrown in during the deadline uh, that can give you an advantage over other teams who don't. Uh, but the second advantage to bunkering is if the challenge is at a project that has scarce work, bunkering can be used to actually prevent other teams from downloading enough to keep them busy. The tactic is usually deployed while work is available and you suck up all the 10 days worth of work and then this tactic can even be deployed when there is less than 10 days left in the challenge. So even if those points aren't tallied during the challenge, you will in essence be preventing other teams from getting those points as well. As mentioned, a lot of teams bunker during the challenges. This does not mean that the entire team does it. However, some will encourage the behavior because it does give them a leg up on the challenge. 
Some projects won't need the work back immediately and therefore do not mind getting the results back in such a way. With advanced warning, they can even prepare for bunkering behavior. So this brings the question, why wouldn't you want to bunker? Well, bunkering is typically a selfish tactic that only benefits the competition and the user itself, him or herself. Bunking, bunkering theoretically hurts the project because if you think about it or think of it from the project's perspective, you're, they're sending out work that needs to be done and someone's deliberately withholding the results until a later date for the sheer fun of it. That's right, people are bunkering, that are bunkering are actually retarding the project's research. If you think about it, what if those work units were the cure for a disease? What if you postponing the analysis of that work prevented someone from having that cure? We don't know the real world cause and effects, and we don't even know if they would analyze that work any faster. So it's kind of a, a hindsight and you'll never actually truly know anyway because you won't be there to see the end result. Second thing to consider is does it put more strain on project servers? Yes, some project servers continue to create work as there is demand. If people are vacuuming up work, this will create and require a lot more space for hosting results that could have been removed from the database. This raises operational costs and you also bog their network down with large uploads that normally the project doesn't have to deal with. Since there's already a challenge going on, their servers are already taxed. Now you have a couple hundred or maybe thousand users bunkering 10 plus times the, the uploads all at once that they normally would. So. Some people see this as an extremist point of view, and some would argue the scientists will wait for an entire batch to be completed before analyzing it anyway. The truth is that nobody will ever really know, as I mentioned, whether or not bunkering was good or bad. So we always say, it's your judgment call, do what you, you want to do, and hopefully you don't abuse the project too much. If the project ever comes out and says, please don't do it, please honor their wishes. So as I, I was saying, there, there are a few ways that you can bunker. Uh, the obvious, easiest way is to just go into your options, computing preferences. You can store at least 10 days worth of work. That would try to bunker as much work as possible. As you can see, I'm still pulling Rosetta work. Once it finished downloading its entire cache, I would just come up here to activity and suspend network activity. And doing that means Boink will not try to update with any of the servers. It will not try to pull new work. It will not um, upload any work. Basically, it'll just sit idle until I tell it to uh, start transferring it again. To upload work all over again, once it's done, you just basically go back to activity and then network activity based on preferences or activity always. I always have mine set on always just because I, I don't want anything else to interfere with it and I want my working units to report back immediately. So that was the simplest way. Um, sometimes a project such as World Community Grid or a few others won't give you enough work to actually fulfill a full 10 day cache. So some people have to go through more tricky ways to get a larger cache. One way is to spoof your CPUs, which I have a video on. You can search my list of videos for that. Uh, by using that tactic, you can make a single core computer look like it has, say, 80 cores, and it'll try to download enough work to feed 80 cores. Obviously, a single core would not want to run 80 at a time, but you can do that. Another tactic some people will do is using virtual machines. Um, as you can see on this computer, I have multiple virtual machines that are running. Um, each one of those can download its own full amount of work. So if I gave each one of those virtual ma machines my total amount of actual threads that are in my computer, um, which would not be wise, but if I did, they each could pull a full amount of work from the project as if they were an individual PC. Um, 
You can also use dual boot options if you want to run multiple operating systems or if you even want to use multiple different hard drives and have the same operating system installed on each one. Uh, you could do that. Uh, you can also run multiple clients within Boink. I do have a another video showing how to run multiple clients for the Goofy XGrid project. Uh, the concept is pretty much the same. You can run each one of those as an individual client and download additional work for them. Um, if you're bunkering work for a CPU project and you want your GPUs to continue to pull work and report work from the projects, uh, basically, say in this case, um, like my primary operating system here has a GPU capability say I was pulling work from Rosetta, had all of it filled up, had a large cache, but I still wanted to pull work from Prime Grid. It is possible to block the individual project. Uh, you can do that either on your individual PC by going into your Windows or your Linux firewalls and actually putting in exclusions to block the, the, the uh, website from communicating. Um, you can also go into your hosts file, which if you don't know where that is on Windows, it's just Windows, System32, drivers, etc., hosts. You can go in there and you can edit that. Um, there's various different ways. You can also go and log into your router's firewall and block the website from there. Uh, it all depends on how much effort you want to put into it, what works best for you. If you're just wanting to block one computer, it's best to do it on the PC level. If you're wanting to block your entire network because you got a lot of hosts, it's better to just to configure the, the router. Um, but there are several different ways you can do it, and then you just want to undo those settings whenever you're, you're ready to drop your bunker. Um, we can go into more detail. I don't want to walk you through each individual one of these just because it's a lot of different settings. Everybody's routers will be different, different firewalls. It's a muck. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to go into our forums. This is my team's forum right here. I'll have it in the comments section in the description. Um, that way you can come find us. All of us are willing to walk you through any of this stuff. Um, but that's the best and simplest way I can really show you or explain to you uh, what you'll need to be doing for the upcoming challenges. Rosetta at home is very heavy on the L3 cache. I don't recommend running more than one work unit per four megabyte of L3 cache if you're worried about efficiency. Um, however, you're more than welcome to run it on every thread. I usually don't worry too much about it unless I am really pushing points. Um, every system is going to be a little different, so if you don't have a lot of identical systems, it's, it's a lot of work to get every one of them fine-tuned. But I wanted to point that out because a lot of people don't realize that even though they have faster systems, they may be bottlenecked by that cache. I also recommend that you have a lot of RAM in your system because Rosetta at home uh, does take a lot more RAM than some of the other projects. Um, it also has a lot of uh, IOs uh, when it first starts up the application. So if you've got a system that has a lot of cores, a lot of threads in it, it will hammer your hard drive. So if you still got one of the old traditional spinner hard drives, you're, you're going to have some problems. Um, or at least it's going to be a while before it, it, it's responsive. So definitely uh, consider using solid state hard drives for your point data directories. and. Uh, Make sure you got lots of RAM and L3 cache. So if this was helpful for you, uh, please like the video. Again, uh, subscribe to the channel. I, I do plan on making a lot more videos, but um, I'm hoping this was helpful for some people who've never ran Rosetta at home and gives you kind of an idea how, how to interact with it. But uh, if you have any other questions, definitely reach out to me and I'd be happy to help. So until next time, have a good one.